Okay, up until now, we looked at the performance of a multinomial classification problem in terms of its classification capabilities. In other words, we did not take into consideration any concept of probability or confidence. We basically looked at how well the given model classifies records. Now we're going to relax that assumption and uh, also look at the predicted probability side. Well, actually, it's not relaxing. It's kind of becoming more strict. So not only we are asking to perf uh, evaluate the performance of our model in terms of classification side, but we're also interested in evaluating the actual predicted probabilities of uh, the corresponding class membership. So let's see how this uh, can be done and what kind of uh, evaluation formulas it will result to. And again, uh, in this case, I'm assuming that we start with the data set. Uh, the data set indexed by 1, 2, 3, all the way to n, n observations. And of course, there are some axes out there. I'm not interested in those at this point. And each observation belongs to one of the K target classes. So this is my target Y. And suppose I observe that uh, records fall into class 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 2, and 3. So those are all of those class. Uh, each record is recorded as belonging to a specific class. And I have uh, K classes. In my case here, k will be equals to 3 for the sake of simplicity. Now, how do I build uh, probabilities, or how do I build uh, uh, a response model that essentially assigns uh, predicted probabilities to each of the uh, available target classes? The way it is usually done is uh, by constructing k different response surfaces. And in this case, they have k uh, equals 3 classes. So what will happen is that we will construct the response surface for class 1, the response surface for class 2, and the response surface for class 3. Now, how can this be done? In the simplistic case, you would basically, let's say, you need the response surface for class 1. So you could take class 1 and uh, try to build a model that attempts to separate class 1 from all of the remaining classes. Uh, this approach is generally known as 1 versus the rest. And if you do that model, let's say it could be a logistic regression model or it could be a separating hyperplane model, the actual details are irrelevant. The point is the end result of that model will be a column of predicted responses for class 1. So have H11, H21, H31, and HN1. Similarly, if I focus on class 2, uh, class 2, K equals 2, I can build a response surface for class 2 that separates class 2 from everyone else. So I'm going to get H12, H22, H32, and HN2. And similarly, for the class 3, I'll get uh, its own response surface, H13, H23, H33, HN3. Okay, so I get all of those response surfaces, and usually uh, there is no restrictions on what those numbers could be. They could be positive, negative, large, small, it doesn't matter. And uh, there's a number of algorithms out there that simplify under such assumptions. So say the response surface could be just a linear combination of axes or some kind of other function that resembles that. Okay, so now I have that, and uh, the very first thing to do is convert these numbers into predicted probabilities. Now that can be done uh, using this formula over here. And if you study this formula, what happens is the following. First of all, each number here is exponentiated. So I, I take the exponents of all of those numbers. Now the exponentiation is a nice function. Why? Because for any x from negative infinity to positive infinity, the exponent 
is strictly positive. Therefore, once I do the exponent, regardless of what happened, all of those cells now become strictly positive. And then I calculate predicted probability of each class as simply the fraction of this cell with respect to the sum of all of the remaining cells, and I do it on a row-by-row -row basis. And this gives me essentially the predicted probability associated with each class. So to summarize what I've just have done, we can say that once you have your response surfaces h of x, there will be k of those, you can use the exponentiation trick together with that formula uh, to replace all of those, uh, to essentially construct predicted probabilities for uh, each class, for each observation. So it will be p11, p12, p13, p21, p22, p23, p31, p32, p33, and the PN1, PN2, PN3. So those are all predicted probabilities. And the nice thing about this formula is that all of these belong to 0, 1 interval. In other words, you cannot really get them strictly 0 or strictly 1. Uh, they're always uh, n n nicely in between, even though they can approach to those boundaries rather nicely. Now, having done that, now I want to evaluate the performance of my multinomial classification in the probability scale. And this can be done using the cost function known as the negative log likelihood. It's introduced here, and you can easily understand what happens uh, by studying uh, the structure of this formula here. Well, first of all, notice I'm taking average over observations, so the sum of those terms averaged over observations. And again, the average is used usually to make it uh, the result invariant with respect to data set size, so it's easier to compare. Uh, the core part is this log term, and notice the log takes only one component of the row-wise predicted probability and specifically it takes the predicted probability of the observed class. Again, it's instructive to see how it's done. So, for example, in observation number one, I observed class one. Therefore, I'm taking the predicted probability of class one, and I take the log of it. On observation number three, I observed class two, so I'm taking the predicted probability of class 2, because remember, these are my classes, 1, 2, 3, and these are the predicted probabilities, of class 1, 2, and 3. So I'm taking the log of this uh, as the term here, and likewise, depending on what I observe, I take the log of the corresponding predicted probability, and I simply add those up. And because each probability is within the 0, 1 range, the log will be always negative, and then negative, negative cancel, and I get a cost function, which is essentially uh, the multinomial log likelihood or average log likelihood. Now, again, it's nice uh, to see what happens to our cost when uh, you have uh, a situation of a perfect model. And a perfect model will be an ideal case when... Uh, on all of the observed classes, the predicted probability of observed class is 1.0, and all of the remaining probabilities are zero. So in an ideal case, what happens to this probability is it's always 1. The log of 1 gives you 0, and the cost will be j equals 0 when the ideal case. Okay? On the other hand, when you have an unfortunate situation when uh, the predicted probability of observed class goes towards zero, this log goes towards negative infinity, and the whole cost goes towards positive infinity. So J approaches positive infinity when you have uh, the worst case of misclassification. But you also see here that 
whenever that misclassification happens, that record really kind of dominates the cost function because this log becomes uh, extremely large in absolute value. Uh, and that is where it's important that probabilities cannot be exactly zero or exactly one, and that's what that exponentiation trick has accomplished for us. But otherwise, you may focus on minimizing uh, multinomial log likelihood, uh, negative log likelihood, and uh, the smaller the number, the better, the, the closer the model is to the ideal case, which is uh, the model that makes the ideal probabilistic predictions. And that's in general how you could evaluate multinomial models based on that. Now, um, is this something that's always used? By, by all means not. The problem is that what I've just shown assumes that the actual model gives you some kind of response surface H of X, and then we use the exponentiation trick to construct the probabilities. Well, there is a class of modeling approaches out there, generally known as ensemble techniques, uh, for which this intermediate H and exponentiation of H step is kind of inconvenient, and it's a lot easier to construct predicted probability directly by looking at that model output. Now, in an ensemble, what usually happens, you have a bunch of models, and each model is a classifier. It could be separating hyperplanes or trees or anything. And then uh, each model assigns a given record to one of the K classes. And when you have a lot of those models, you basically treat it as if each model voted for a specific class. So at the end of that iteration, you simply count the percent of votes cast for each class, and that percent of votes becomes uh, the predicted probability associated with the given class. Now, the problem is that under voting, whenever you have voting, the predicted probability could belong, I mean, it could become zero or it could become one. Zero means that you had zero votes cast to the given class. One means that all votes were cast to the given class. And that zero will cause a real problem with this log term if it happens to be zero votes cast for the class that's actually observed. Now, that's a very bad situation. That's why log likelihood doesn't like it, wants to penalize it the most. But what if you had a record simply misclassified, or there was a record that just happened there by mistake? It really belongs to a different class, but it was not assigned to that class for whatever reason. So you don't want to really use log likelihood function to handle those cases because of that lack of robustness with respect to the outliers. And that's where an alternative measure of performance is introduced, and it's known generally as margin. Now, margin, uh, technically, it, it's not a true cost function. Uh, it's like the, the negative of the cost function, if you wish, because uh, uh, just like in a log likelihood, you want to maximize log likelihood, meaning you want to minimize the negative log likelihood. In the margin, it's kind of the other way around. You want to maximize margin, so the cost function would be defined as this margin, uh, and you have to take a negative of it or something like that. But again, for now, let's just focus on the mechanics of cal calculating the margin. In this case, we could actually rename it as margin so that it's not directly interpreted as a cost function just yet. So when you t calculate margin, what happens is, is again, you're taking an, an average over observations, and on each observation, you're taking the predicted probability of observed class. So it's the same probability as taken in the log likelihood formulation. But instead of taking the log of it, now you're subtracting the maximum of the remaining probabilities that not include uh, the observed class. Okay, so for example, here, I'm taking observed class one, so I'm taking this predicted probability and I subtract the max of those two. Likewise, here I take this probability and I subtract the max of those two. 
and so on and so forth. And by the way, notice that usually in uh, uh, any the predictive modeling construction, there's also the predicted class assignment. And so far, we haven't used it, and we are not going to use it. Just by looking ahead, normally, what happens is that whatever, whoever class gets the largest predicted probability will be the actual class assignment. So you could have one, two, uh, say, uh, two, three, two, one, one, uh, three. Okay? And that's based on the max predicted probability for each of the individual classes. But for now, in order to calculate the, max, uh, the, the margin, we simply work with uh, the predicted probability of the true observed class minus the max of the other two. And again, it's instructive to see what happens to margin in the ideal case and in the worst case scenario. In the ideal case, this probability is going to be 1 because the observed class, and we are predicting that we are going to observe it with probability 1.0, and the max of those two will be zero. So in the ideal case, margin is going to be 1.0. So it's the ideal case. Uh, on the other hand, in the worst case scenario, the probability of true observed class will be zero. And therefore, and probability of at least one of the remaining classes will be one. And in this case, the margin will be, if it happened on every record, the margin will be negative 1.0. And this is the worst case. So therefore, we've just uh, confirmed that margin belongs to this simple symmetric interval from minus 1 to plus 1. And it avoids this infinity problem that plagues the log likelihood in the case when you have exact zero count of votes. And of course, to convert margin into the cost function, you would simply redefine cost as the negative margin or put the negative in front of here. I mean, the exact specifics are kind of irrelevant as long as you understand how the, the concept of margin arises in general and what it does to you in terms of evaluating the performance. So at this point, it should be clear to you that there are many different ways to evaluate performance of uh, classification problems. There's a host of techniques stem from uh, uh, basically evaluating how well we perform as a classifier. There is a whole other host of techniques that also make it a more uh, demanding criterion. You know, we also want to nail the predicted probability of a certain event. So depending on what you want, you can work with either one type of uh, performance evaluators or another. In the end run, it will always depend on the type of data you have and what are the goals uh, that you have in mind. So you kind of have the access to all of these different performance evaluation criteria, but you as an analyst would have to decide what is it that's really relevant to you. It, whether you're just interested in predicting, making the right class assignments, or you're interested in using the actual predicted probability of those class assignments, uh, or whether you're interested in one class versus another, whether you're interested in expected cost, or in a binary classification case, whether you're interested in things like precision, recall, or area on the RRC curve, or gains, or anything like that. So there's a lot of different choices. The, the purpose of this series was to introduce you to what's available out there. And I haven't been able to cover all of them, but this is a good start, and hopefully it will clarify uh, all of the different terminology that people use out there, and it will make your understanding a lot easier in all of that. In what follows, uh, I will talk about even more exotic modeling situations, but by and large, what you have learned at this point is good enough to get you started on uh, uh, evaluating performance of a large variety of different models out there.